Hey everyone, Andy Robertson here with CQ Academy and in today's video I want to talk to you about a really important topic called process capability. All right, let's head over to the computer. All right, so here's the agenda for today's discussion on process capability. I want to start here at the top left by just having a, like a brief intro to what is process capability, how do we use it, why do we do it, and then once you understand that, I want to talk about some of the most common indices that we use or that you might be familiar with in terms of quantifying and calculating process capability. And then by the time it's all over, I want to get to this last discussion where we talk about how to interpret your capability results. So throughout all this, we're going to go through a few examples. And then in those examples, I want you to be able to finally understand how you can interpret those results and what that means for your process and your customer. All right, so let's get into what is process capability. Okay, so you have some process and your process has some output. And what I'm showing here is a distribution of that output. And I'm assuming that it's normally distributed. And by the way, that's an assumption here in process capability that the output of your process is normally distributed. Okay, so that's what you see here. There's some mean value, there's some standard deviation. And then the other thing I wanna show, because this is important for this idea of process capability, are the specification limits. So this is the upper specification limit, and this is the lower specification limit. And the reason that I show that is because the definition of process capability analysis is a tool or a method to quantify the capability of our process to meet the design specifications. So we build a product for our customer, our customer has a specification, and a capability analysis study tells us or quantifies how much of our product is actually gonna meet the customer's needs. And when we add the specification limits on top of this output graph, we can then begin to imagine or visualize the amount of non-conforming product. So there is a portion of our distribution here on either end of the tails that will not meet the specification limits. It's non-conforming. And this is what process capability analysis does for us. It allows us to understand and quantify what portion of our product is not going to meet the customer's needs. All right, so now I want to introduce you to what I would call the most basic indice for calculating process capability. And before I go into the equation, I want to talk about CP because it's often thought of as a measure of the potential of your process. So most uh, process capability studies don't even reflect the CP value because it's very much about the potential. And it's also, and I'll explain this in a second, what the process might be able to achieve if the process was centered. So let me do two different examples to help illustrate this point about CP reflecting the potential of your process. So let's take an example here. We have the output of our process. The standard deviation is two. And of course we have the CP calculation. It's the upper spec limit minus the lower spec limit divided by six sigma. So let's visualize this by adding the upper and lower spec and the width of the upper and lower spec is 12. Okay, this is just a theoretical 12. And if we complete the, the CP calculation, we've got upper spec minus lower spec, and that's 12, divided by six times two is one. So our CP value is one. And of course you can see here, there is a small portion of our distribution that is outside the specification limits and would be non-conforming. Now let's do one more example to really help you understand what I'm trying to say up here at the top. And let's take our exact same process, right? Same standard deviation of two. And let's talk about what happens if the process is not centered. So let's say our process shifts to the left here, okay? The width of the distribution is still 12. Our standard deviation is still two. But what we see here is that we have this large portion of the distribution that is now non-conforming. But if we work through the equation, the CP value still comes out to the same answer of one. And these are like conflicting results here. How can our process capability calculation come to the same conclusion, but we have one distribution that has substantially more non-conforming product than the other? And this goes back to the original point that CP tells you what your process might be able to achieve if the process was centered. Now, not every process is centered, and this is why the majority of continuous improvement experts or quality engineers prefer the CPK index, okay? And the CPK index penalizes processes that are not centered, and it is a much more accurate reflection of the true process capability. 
So I wanna use this opportunity to work an example. So before we do that, let me show you the equation. So the CPK value is the minimum value between two different CP values. It's CP upper and CP lower. So CP upper, which you can see the equation for here, is essentially the CP value of the upper spec limit relative to the mean value divided by three sigma. And the CP lower is essentially the mean value relative to the lower specification limit divided by three sigma. And whichever one of these is worse is gonna define the ultimate process capability value. So let's plug in some numbers here. Let's define some numbers here and then work the equation backwards. So similar to the previous example, our standard deviation is gonna be two. Our upper spec will be 14 and our lower spec will be two. So the specification width would still be that 12 value here that we see here, okay? And then the average value of the process is now six. So we're off center, our average value is six. And let's see what happens when we plug in these parameters into our CPK equation. So we've got upper spec minus the mean divided by three times two. Six minus two, which is the lower spec minus the mean divided by six. And when we find the minimum value between these two, what we find is that our CPK value is 0.66. Now that's a much more accurate reflection of our process capability given the amount of non-conforming material that we would expect from our process in this condition. Now let's see what happens to CPK when we center up our process. So we're gonna leave everything the same here except we're just gonna center up our process. Okay, so the only thing that shifted in all of our parameters here, or all of our variables, is that the mean value is now eight. So it previously was six, and now it's eight, and let's recalculate the process capability for our new process. So upper spec is 14, mean value is eight, the mean value is eight minus the lower spec of two, and essentially both of these fractions go down to one, and our CPK value is now 1.0. And again, this is a much more accurate reflection of the true process capability here. So if you're looking to calculate or quantify process capability, you should always use CPK and not CP because again, CP is more about the potential of your process, not the actual process capability. Okay, so now let's switch gears and talk about a different index for calculating process capability. And before we talk about this, I wanna show you the equations and I wanna explain the difference. Okay, so here's that CP value that we just talked about, and you can see the equation. Upper spec minus the lower spec divided by six sigma, okay? And here's the equation for the PP index. It's the upper spec minus the lower spec divided by six sigma. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, Andy, aren't those the exact same equation? And the answer is yes. Now the difference is in how the estimates of the standard deviation are calculated. So here on the left, what we use is the long form technical equation for estimating or calculating the standard deviation. Now, if you don't know how to do this, I have a whole separate video on that. So go check that out later after this video. But here's how we calculate standard deviation using the long form. When we talk about the CP index or the CPK index, what we use to estimate the standard deviation is actually data from Statistical Process Control, or SPC, or more commonly called control charts. So again, I have a whole video on this. If you wanna learn more about control charts and the X bar R chart, I have a whole nother video. But in that video, what we learned is that we can take our data from our control charts and we can use this data to convert our average range value, R bar, into an estimate of the standard deviation using the D2 conversion factor. But there's something important you have to know here. When we're doing our control chart, that R bar value, that average range, only considers within subgroup variation, okay? Same thing with the X bar and S chart. So if you were using an X bar and S chart and you knew S bar, you could convert that into an estimate of the standard deviation using the C4 factor. Now you might be wondering, why don't we always just simply use this long form calculation? And this is the most important part of this entire discussion. So if your process is in statistical control, these two estimates of the standard deviation will be nearly identical, okay? If this estimate of the standard deviation is much larger than this one, essentially what that implies is that your process is not in a state of statistical control.
And the reason this is important is because you can't or shouldn't be doing process capability studies if your process is not within statistical control. This whole idea of process capability is a, a method or a tool to allow us to make projections into the future about how many defective units or conforming units our process will produce in the future. But if your process is not in control and it's under the influence of special cause variation, then all of those projections around defect rates and conforming units are essentially meaningless and useless because you can't make any predictions about your process. So if this is the case that your CP value and your PP value are wildly different, it is because you are experiencing some sort of special cause variation. And as a quality engineer or a continuous improvement expert, the first thing you should do is to eliminate all those special cause variations, get your process in a state of statistical control, and then estimate your process capability. Because your process capability should really truly only reflect the common cause variation within your process. That makes sense? So I always encourage people to use CPK because it forces you to make sure your process is in statistical control because that's really step number one before we start talking about process capability, okay? And then PPK is very similar to CPK and it's this exact same discussion. Again, the only difference is how we calculate the standard deviation. Again, your process should be in control, statistically in control before you start estimating process capability. And if your process is in control, CPK and PPK will be nearly identical values, okay? Other than that, the equations are exactly the same. We're looking for the minimum value between CP upper and CP lower. And again, it's all just about how we calculate the standard deviation. Okay, so that's the PPK index. And now we come to the last slide, which is how do we interpret our results? So let's say we did that example earlier and we had a CPK value of 0.66. What does that actually mean for my process? Or what can I tell my customers? Or what can I put into my PFMEA as an accurate reflection of right, the occurrence rate of some defect? And so what I'm showing here is common CPK values. And then what I've done is I've translated those into a handful of different metrics around defect rates or conformance rates. So if you're familiar with Six Sigma, let's talk about this first one. This is the Sigma level. And it essentially represents how many standard deviations you're capturing above and below the mean. So graphically, it looks like this. So in the situation where our CPK is 0.33, we are plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation above and below the mean, right? This is That's the plus one sigma designation. 68.27% of our product will be conforming. And then defects per million. So this is a metric that says if we built a million units, 317,000 of those would be non-conforming. And that's all of the material out here in the tails of our distribution that are either above the spec or below the spec. And again, here we are making projections into the future. If we built a million units, how many of them would be defective or non-conforming? 317,000. And then depending on how you structure your PFMEAs or other risk management documents, your defect rate here is essentially about one in three products is going to be non-conforming. And then we can talk about this for different levels of CPK. So if our CPK doubles, our sigma level doubles, we're now plus or minus two standard deviations away from the mean. And now 95.45% of our distribution is now conforming to the specifications. If we built a million products, 45,000 of those would be non-conforming or about 4.55%. And our defect rate falls to about one in 22 units. Similarly here, if your CPK value is three, we're now talking about 99.7% of your distribution is conforming. Only 2,700 units out of a million would be defective. And your defect rate is about 1 in 370. I'm not going to walk through all of these, but you can see how sequentially as your CPK value gets larger, the sigma level goes up, and your distribution now fits nicely within your specification limits. What I'm showing you here on the screen is actually a CPK value of 2.0. So we are plus six standard deviations on the right side, minus six standard deviations on the left side, and 99.9999998% of our distribution is conforming, and our defect rate is about one in 500 million. Now the question I often get is, what level of process capability do I need? And the answer is it really depends on the criticality and the risk of whatever you're measuring.
So if we're talking about some sort of quality attribute that might fail and result in some sort of catastrophic loss of life, like let's say it's a plane crash, well then a, a CPK value of 2.0 or greater might be the minimum requirement. We don't want planes to crash and one in 500 million is a good target or, or it should even be better than that. Now on the other hand, if you're talking about some toy that you expect to break in a few weeks and it's a super cheap thing and there's no criticality, no risk to the end user, you know, maybe a CPK value of 0 0.67 is absolutely acceptable and a 1 in 22 defect rate isn't going to be a problem. So it really, again, depends on the criticality and the risk. Make sense? All right, that's it for today. I really hope you liked it. If you did, hit that like button. And if you want to take the next step in becoming a CQE, hit that subscribe button so that as I publish new videos, you get notified. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much. Bye.